Все, ялла. Ялла. Все, конец. Okay. Okay. Все, okay.
cold. Uh, yeah, but the sun shouldn't be too far away.
And that was it for our Kellett Sandy Lake trek. So we made it back down to Trousseau Valley, where we'd already been before actually trekking a few weeks uh, previously. So we didn't hang around for too long. We just got our driver to come and pick us up and crashed out after a very long three days. <laughs> very long and tough three days. Uh, the trek, the Kellett Sandy Lake trek, is about 28 kilometres, uh, which isn't super long, but it's definitely good to do over three days. You have to go over two high mountain passes and there's a lack of good places to camp uh, once you get past the place where we camp for the first night so uh, three days is really the, the kind of ideal limit for the trek max elevation is about 3400 meters often there's no trail uh, so you have to do a lot of route finding and the train's very difficult as well um, very rewarding trek but a tough one too yeah it's basically a volcanic plateau so it's like rocks rocks rocks, more rocks and uh, some more rocks and shale on top of that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty tough going and sort of quite a demanding trek, but mm -hmm. you've got these insane landscapes all around you. You know, the colours, rhubarb and pistachio on the mountainsides and uh, the Sulphur River when you're coming back down, all red. Mm -hmm. and it, it's really amazing, but yeah, it's definitely a tough one. And there is a severe lack of water on mm -hmm. this trek. Your only guaranteed water source between starting the trek and getting to the lake is the lake itself. You might come across some water before that, depending on the season. We managed to fill up at a melting snowfield just before the pass, but yeah, that makes it quite challenging. We had to carry eight litres of water with us from the get go uh, for the two of us for day one, camping, making food, yeah. breakfast the next morning, getting up over the pass and all that jazz. So uh, it's probably more of a, you know, experienced only kind of uh, trekkers should be doing it really i would say so so tell me a bit more about the actual sort of trek obviously you saw what it's like it's beautiful day one is 6.4 kilometers it would probably take you about two to three hours mm. to hike it it's a pretty easy day and you camp at a plateau which is about 2640 meters and it was really quite cold there. <laughs> it was quite um, cold, yeah. We had heavy ice and frost on the tent yeah. in the morning. Um, it was pretty chilly. Day two is about 9.65 kilometres. It is a much tougher day. It probably takes anywhere between five and eight hours, depending on your speed and, and whatnot. And yeah, you've got a big climb up to a pass and then you've got to go down again. So your highest point that day is 3,428 metres at the Horasar Pass mm -hmm. um, and, and you, then you're sleeping just under 3,100 metres at Kelitsadi Lake so again chilly. Yes and the uh, <laughs> third and final day you go up over the High Essie Pass and back down to Trousseau Valley it is uh, about 12 kilometres again it could take you between five and eight hours depending on speed, fitness, uh, how comfortable you are going over big rocks and shale yeah. and negotiating the trail and things like that. So that day you've got about just under 500 metres going up mm -hmm. in total, but you've got big descent. You've got over 1300 metres uh, coming back down to Trusso Valley. So mostly it's all about the descent that day. Yeah, and the max <laughs> elevation is similar to the previous day uh, on the High Essie Pass. It's similar to the Horosar Pass, about 3,420. Yeah, so on this trek, you should say 
I really was not feeling very well. Uh, I kind of before we even left Casbegi in the morning of the, the, the day one, I had like a bad stomach and I felt really nauseous. As we got up to the plateau on the first night, I had a really bad headache. I wasn't drinking as much water as I would like because we were having to conserve water because there's nowhere to fill up. Mm -hmm. And even though we've been trekking a lot in Georgia recently, we'd actually spent a couple of weeks at lower altitude again. And I kind of didn't even think about the fact that I might be affected by altitude. I usually am. I'm slow at acclimatizing basically. So mm -hmm. Dell was totally fine, but I definitely had the altitude headache and, and whatnot and was not feeling good at all. Anyway, so day one of the trek is the easiest day. Really, like we said, it's only a few hours, uh, but the views, if you've got good weather, are absolutely spectacular. Kind of starts off just walking up those switchbacks on the road. Mm -hmm. After that, there's sort of a bit of a trail uh, that you can follow. And yeah, if you've got good weather, those views of Kazbegi are absolutely amazing. We were just really taking our time. We said it should take you two, three hours. It took us like six hours to get to that plateau because we were just loving it, just enjoying the views. Yeah, I mean, uh, I always record on the watch uh, moving time and our moving time was about two and a half hours, but as Kim said, it took us a long time <laughs> because, I mean, why not? Uh, we still got there at like, uh, 3.30, 4 in the afternoon and had plenty yeah. of time. But if you want to get there quickly, it's really easy to do. So yeah. you could start this trek in the afternoon yeah. uh, and get there in plenty of time. Yeah. There's some shepherds uh, that sometimes graze their, their sheep up on that plateau. So there was a huge flock of sheep. Mm. Thankfully, they had no dogs with them on the first day when we set up camp. Um, there was one shepherd there. You do be a bit wary in case there's dogs around. We saw the dogs the next morning, actually. And don't set up your, your camp like too close to them. The next day is um, a tough day. There's no, there's no denying it. So walk up the plateau. That's nice and easy. And then you basically hit boulder fields, loads of rocks, and you just have to pick your way across them. There's no trail to follow. You're just sort of checking your GPX uh, mm. tracks, check, checking maps, me or whatever, and, and sort of following that up. So there is occasionally a suggestion of a trail. You can see where people have gone but we found it was very easy to lose or as it would just disappear altogether. Yeah. Um, you would be following a bit of a trail and then there'd just be more rocks. Yeah, um, so just use your noggin, look around, aye. just you know, pay attention to the landscape and, and pick the most sensible way to go. Yeah, you know where you're aiming for. Like first there's a, a saddle that you're going for and then after that, we took a small rest there and then we headed up towards the pass itself. Views at the top of the pass, absolutely spectacular. Mm -hmm. Totally loved it. You get your first view of Kelitsadi Lake way, way, way down below. Mm -hmm. Not only that, we had amazing views uh, back towards the Chauhi Massive, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. which we'd hiked uh, past on the Juta Taroshka trek. Yeah. So that was really nice to see some uh, big piece of scenery that we'd uh, hiked past yeah. you know, a month before. Yeah, so we were really lucky with the weather. I mean, we tend to sort of time it with that. There was not a single cloud in the sky until like the end of day three. It was really, really spectacular. And we could see just all the mountains everywhere around. So if you can time it with good weather, definitely, uh, definitely worth it. It's a huge reward for the effort that you're putting in. And on that note as well, if it's bad weather, I think this trail could be pretty dangerous because all those rocks, everything's going to be really, really slippery and Quite frankly, it's a lot of effort to put in for no views. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would reconsider if it's not very good weather. So from the top of the pass, you have got a pretty hairy descent, I have to say. That's probably the toughest descent on the whole trek. It's very, very steep. There are cairns along the way. So we were basically just like aiming for the cairns, got sections where you have to go over rocks. There were some very, very steep bits, but going down, mostly you could just sort of slide your foot down on that kind of, you know, small shale, loose stone things. Actually, the killer that day was you think that you're descending all the way to Kelitsadi Lake, but when we were at the top of the pass, we realised that actually it's like back up again. So you get to the bottom of this really steep section, which I think took us about an hour and a half or something, yeah. and then as, a, as like adding insult to injury, you've got to, to go up a hill again. I was like raging at that point, <laughs> feeling sick and all of that. And we made it to the lake at about 6.30 p.m. just as the sun was leaving that lovely patch of grass where we were going to camp. We just got dinner on and enjoyed our morning basically at the lake mm -hmm. the next day when it was so, so still, so quiet. You could hear like birds every now and again. They say that oh, silence is deafening thing and that was definitely what it was like. It was just 
unbelievably quiet and, and beautiful and still and those reflections were just really, really gorgeous. So as you'll have noticed from the video, it was another frosty morning. Uh, so the tent was covered in ice and everything had like a really nice look to it. The colours were amazing that, that early in the morning. Uh, they were also amazing when the sun came up a bit more. But we enjoyed our morning at the lake. Probably spent a little bit too much time and left a little bit later than we should have. But I don't think we left till about 11 o'clock in the morning in the end. Again, yeah. I wasn't feeling well and yeah, just everything was a lot slower than it should have been. So third day, um, we walked around the lake and started the ascent up towards the High Essie Pass. And it wasn't really too bad, to be honest. You yeah. know, it's a few hundred meters. We kind of cut across and then at the last moment headed up towards the pass. It was like a shale climb, mm -hmm. uh, steep in parts. Mostly it was fine and it actually only took about an hour to an hour and a half mm -hmm. to get to the top of the pass. And suddenly you've got those views mm -hmm. of Kazbeki again. It was incredible. It's, it's really, really nice. You've got all these crazy shards um, of rock that are sort of surrounding you. You can see back down to the lake if you wander a little bit and um, further beyond the pass. And just, yeah, crazy, crazy mountain shapes. Like, am I in Georgia? What is this? You know, like, colours are incredible and everything. So really, really spectacular up there. And then the descent is pretty steep initially. There's not really any clear trail going down. You've just got to pick a way head for a cairn down in the bottom. Again, you're not just descending the whole way. You've got a section where you have to climb up again, which from there on, you've pretty much got a trail most Mostly. of the way back down. You've got this amazing red river that appears, which is the sulphur water. There's a point where you have to cross the river, but it was easy enough to jump over on stones. We didn't get our feet wet or anything. And then a bit of a hairy section right at the end because you're following sheep trails on really steep slide sided mountain. And some of the sections of the mountain trail have eroded away. So there are a few points um, which are a bit hairy there. We didn't really film Unfortunately, those bits. <laughs> we weren't able to capture that. We were running Would have been a bit late even more time. dangerous. Um, yeah. And obviously, the danger yeah. element too. I think the main takeaway from all of this is uh, this isn't really a trek where you can just, you know, follow the GPS and that's you, or mm. follow a trail on the ground. You really have to be paying attention to the terrain and just, you know, making a decision based on yes, what information you already have, but mm -hmm. also just what you can see around you and what you feel is a better way to go. And it does, you know, it's a bit more time consuming. Um, but yeah, anyway, so you come on, off the sheep trails, amazing views of Trousseau Valley. You could walk all the way out from the valley. If you're a faster walker than us, you could no doubt make it back to the main road on the same day, but it could be, you know, another two hour walk out to Quemo Okrokana, where you can get picked up by most cars, including, you know, not even four wheel drives. If you want to get picked up in the valley itself, you really want someone with like a good four wheel drive. It was pretty hairy in the Lada Neva, especially as soon as it was dark and our driver kept referring to himself as Vasily Schumacher and uh, decided to tear along high canyon roads. It was, it was terrifying, quite frankly. All my nausea went out the window because the adrenaline was just uh, keeping me pumped at that moment. But yeah. Yeah, so we finished, um, our, our GPX track finishes at the a village of Katrissi, mm -hmm. which is largely abandoned, although there's one or two houses there. But yeah, yeah it would take you about two hours to walk back to Quemo Okrakana, where you could arrange to be picked up there, uh, same place you get dropped off to start the hike, pretty much. Yeah, and then if you wanted to walk all the way back to the main road, where it's easier to hitchhike, or get a marshuka if there's one going by, it's another sort of four kilometres. You might want to consider just camping in the Trusso Valley that night. There's no accommodation to stay there. And it's lovely if you've not been to it already. It yeah. is nice and, and worth checking out. In terms of the gear and everything that you need, so like we said, uh, it's a challenging trek. You need to be experienced. This definitely is not for like beginners or, oh, that looks nice, I fancy doing it, mm. and you don't know what you're doing. And you need to have proper gear as well. You need all layers for your clothing, you know, base layer, mid layers, waterproofs, you need proper hiking boots. I'd say you definitely need hiking poles for those steep descents. Camping gear, you need obviously all camping gear that you would need. So we have our big Agnes tent. Uh, we both use Thermarest Neowear camping mats, which are amazing, super lightweight, take up practically no room in the bag, you know, the size of a water bottle. They're great. So you definitely want warm sleeping bags. We were trekking 
towards the end of August. So, you know, still summertime, but mm -hmm. yeah, it was very cold. We also use silk liners, uh, which A, keep you much warmer. It gives you like an extra layer of warmth and B, keeps the bags cleaner because then you're sleeping inside the liner and not the bag. Sleeping bags, especially down sleeping bags, are very difficult to wash. Mm -hmm. Silk liners, we can just chuck in the washing machine so it's easy enough. And personally, we like to have an actual pillow. We're not really ones for just sleeping on top of our clothes. We've got these really good Sea to Summit, uh, I think they're called Eros Light or something. I'll pop a link to all of our, our stuff down below so you can see what we're actually talking about. But they take up like this much room. And they, they weigh nothing. They weigh literally nothing and they are really comfy to use. So we love them. Obviously you need cooking gear. There is nowhere, there's no shops or anything like that. So you need to take all of your food and your cookware with you. We like to take dehydrated meals with us. We've not found any in Georgia so far. So we had a couple of them from uh, home that we brought. Fire pot meals, we really like them. They are very handy, especially when you don't have an awful lot of water because they use a minimum amount and you get a really good meal from it. We have an entire blog post dedicated to this trek actually. So do make sure you go and check that out. The link is down below. Uh, it's over on the website. We've got you know all the maps, all of the trail route description, elevation, trekking times, all that kind of stuff. Our Parking GPX lists. track as well. Yeah. Packing lists, info on how to get to the trailheads, everything you need to know, basically. If you're interested in the actual like camera gear and stuff that we were using to make this video, we use the Sony a7 III camera and the 24-70 f2.8 Sony lens. We record the sound with a Rode Video Mic Pro on top. And we have our trusty tripod, which Dell very patiently sets up, takes the shot, walks, returns, picks up the tripod again, does all those extra miles. Good on you, Dell. Um, it makes it quite easy <laughs> by the fact that it's the amazing Peak Design travel tripod. It really is an amazing piece of kit. I just said amazing twice because that's what it is. Very amazing. enthusiastic <laughs> about this tripod. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really, really great for traveling with. Basically, it's a real space saver and weight saver mm -hmm. without compromising on being full height and extremely easy to use, yeah. so we love that. We also have the Mavic Air uh, drone. <laughs> Keep angling for that Mavic Air too. <laughs> yeah, I'll also pop a link to our full travel photography gear uh, blog post, which is over on the website, which goes into all the ins and outs of all the stuff that we have. If there's anything that we missed and you've got a question about, please do uh, just drop us a comment below. We will get back to you or get in touch with us. If you're actually planning on doing the hike yourself, check out the link uh, to that blog post in the description down below. Uh, if you've just been watching this because you quite like watching the hiking videos, then thank you very much. And also thank you for watching all the way to the end here. I feel like we've been blethering for ages. Um, Some of us have. Why cheap. <laughs> but for now, I think we better go. This, this has been going on for far too long. So if you've enjoyed it, do give us a like. Please subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you get notified whenever we get around to releasing another video. Not that we're lazy. They're just quite time consuming writing up all these things. So um, do hit that bell, ring that bell, uh, drop us a comment, all that jazz. And thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs> Cheerio. <laughs> see ya.